One important debate in the sociology of crime and deviance is the question of how we see criminals. Not just in terms of their social or psychological characteristics, but in terms of the basic nature of criminality. In the early 1980s, right realists like Wilson and Kelling, drawing on a long tradition of ecological theorising about the effect of the physical environment on people's behaviour, changed our perception of criminals. They were no longer to be seen as romanticised outlaws, downtrodden, oppressed or pathological deviants. Rather, they were reinvented as rational beings. Just like when you're looking to buy something, you shop around for the best price. Criminal behaviour, they suggested, mirrored this kind of everyday rationality. The majority of criminals weren't stupid. They knew their patch. They looked around for the best opportunities, ones where the risks and costs were lowest and the benefits highest. The criminal as discerning consumer was born. So if criminals were rational beings, then control agencies could combat crime in a similar rational way. If kids hung around on darkened street corners plotting and planning their next move, the rational thing to do would be to flush them out. Making the street very bright, well lit for example, served two purposes. First, it made it a less attractive place to hang out in the full glare of the police for example, and secondly it meant that ordinary people were no longer intimidated by unruly youth. The streets, it was argued, could be reclaimed by decent folks, and by reclaiming the streets, the community made crime just that bit more difficult, and potentially more costly. Stephen Ling, however, gives us a rather different picture of criminals and the motivations for their behaviour by using the concept of edge work, an idea that was originally applied to various forms of voluntary risk-taking, such as participating in dangerous sports like skydiving. Edge work involves the idea of exploring the edges of everyday life, engaging, as it were, in behaviour that continually pushes the behavioural boundaries in a dangerous, possibly life-threatening way. From this viewpoint, the underlying motivation for criminal behaviour is thrill-seeking, a sense of living dangerously by taking calculated risks. But even skydivers wear a parachute when they jump from a plane. This type of theory sees criminal behaviour, especially the kinds of low-level, highly risky behaviours associated with street crime, as being motivated, as Ling puts it, by a desire to escape from the institutional order of contemporary life. This is an echo of Miller's argument that two of the focal concerns of working-class male youth were the search for fun and excitement. Crime in this context offers the individual psychological rewards, such as challenge and overcoming fear, and sociological rewards, increased self-confidence and feelings of power, control and invincibility that develop from having survived the dangers associated with crime. So the picture we get of the criminal, especially the young working class male criminal from this type of theory, is one that sees involvement in crime as a way of gaining power and status in the group or community, and as exercising some form of control over one's life. To engage in a highly risky behaviour and come out the other side unscathed makes the individual stronger and better prepared to face the next challenge. This has very important implications for crime prevention, as the picture painted by Edgework is very different from that painted by right realism. By increasing the potential costs of crime, a society increases the risks associated with behaviour, and this, of course, is the very thing that makes criminal behaviour such an attractive proposition to potential criminals.